Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special supplementary bonus episode of Black Box Down. I had to pause for a second. I remember what podcast we're doing because, uh, <laughs> on multiple. yeah, Chris and I, uh, in addition to being here, we have a, a guest with us, uh, Blaine Gibson. Yeah. Not the Blaine Gibson who found part of Malaysia 370. Dude, that guy has ruined my social media. I've had to get <laughs> off of Twitter because of that dude. Uh, <laughs> Blaine uh, is on uh, another podcast we do, which we taped an episode of this morning called Tales from the Stinky Dragon. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a Dungeons and Dragons podcast all about. Uh, D&D, Fantasy obviously. And, yeah. yeah. Having fun. Comedy. If you don't know anything about D&D, you don't need to know anything about D&D to listen and enjoy the show. That's actually something we've seen so many comments and they're like, I don't know anything about D&D and I, I actually like it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great introduction in the universe and a lot um, of fun. But also, I've been on the show before, haven't I? Yes. yes. But, yeah. but we're, we're specifically we're yeah. promoting Tales from the Secret Dragon right now because mm. it's also a great time to start that show because we're about to start. Uh, like a new campaign and a new mm-hmm. story. Yeah. So we have a complete one you can listen to and then a new one that's about to kick off. And right now, uh, we are doing a little baby campaign mini, mini that's just campaign. like five episodes and uh, normally Gus is DMs it and I'm DMing this little campaign. Yeah. So it's also a really good starting point if you're like, I don't want to commit to something that's got a lot of episodes. It's only got five, so you could just, just easy time to jump in. Yeah. So it's definitely of one of our favorite shows that we make and we definitely would Love for you to check it out. Just Tales from the Sneaky Dragon. Anywhere you're listening. Wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah. If you like, if you like dry, dry airplane content, and then you want to hear these two, then switch gears into a kooky adventure filled adventure. Adventure filled Tales, adventure. Tales from the Sneaky Dragon. <laughs> uh, but that's that that's not what we're here to focus on in this episode of Black Box Down. Today we're gonna we're gonna be doing like like I said, a uh, a bonus episode. We're gonna be talking about Planes and aviation in movies. Yeah. Each of us uh, brought a movie to talk about, and we watched uh, we watched either the movie or portions of it to uh, to talk about what we saw. Yeah, what we saw, what what's realistic, what's uh, Hollywood uh, fantasy. I have uh, about two pages of notes for mine. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> yours, is, yours is pretty <laughs> so, airplane-packed. Yeah. Uh, Gus, you brought the movie, the 1980 movie Airplane. Yes. And uh, Blaine, you brought the... Uh, 1985 Arnold Schwarzenegger classic, Commando. Classic. And then for my movie, I chose Final Destination from 2000, which uh, the whole plot is based off a plane crash. So I probably saw both Airplane and Commando around probably the same year, I would bet, when mm-hmm. I was a little kid, probably when I was like around eight years old. Final Destination, I didn't get to watch till many years later because <laughs> it didn't come out till the year 2000. So yeah. I was, uh, I was, I was, I was uh, an adult by then. Well, do y'all want to go in? Reverse chronological order. So start with Final Destination. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Final Destination. If you're not familiar, it's a, it's a 2000 horror movie where uh, a group of teenagers are on a plane about to leave for uh, some. Uh, you think they're going to France? Field France. France. Yeah. France. Yeah. And the main character uh, David Devin Sawa uh, is who plays it. Uh, he has like a a dream where he sees the plane crash, which we'll go into detail, and then wakes up, and then everything starts happening like he did in his dream, so he panics and makes everyone get off the plane, and then it leads to, uh, when the plane crashes, they basically, they cheated death, so death is out to get them. Yeah. And crazy things are happening. It's That's a very, It's a very graphic, gratuitous <laughs> yeah. plane crash. I, I, I rewatched it for this, like, oh, yeah. wow, this is uh, it's intense. So this is technically like the dream sequence part, but it starts with, as, as the plane takes off, I thought it was interesting, a group of people almost immediately lean back their seats. Yeah, and, <laughs> not, and, not allowed. And I was like, you can't do that. Oh, a lot uh, of people do that, but yeah. you're not supposed to. And then it kind of starts with like the you know, turbulence, that kind of typical airplane right. movie sequence where it's like, do-do-do-do-do, and also the luggage starts immediately falling, mm-hmm. which doesn't. I, I, I think that's, that's the kind of thing and the Final Destination movies are good at this, where they'll start with, like, they, they kind of build it up. Mm-hmm. And this, this, they start with the turbulence to put, I think, in your mind, like, oh, I've been in turbulence like that before. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, what is it? You know, it really... They it, tether it, it to reality. Right. Yeah. And they make you feel like, oh, I've been in a situation like that. No, I, you actually missed a detail, Chris. Uh, the French teacher, when they reach the air, goes like, hey, puts his hands up in the air. Like they're on a roller coaster? Yeah, yeah, and I was like, I would punch that guy <laughs> on an airplane. I would kill that man. But yeah, and, and, and even to play into that, it starts with the, the turbulence and shaking, but then it settles and everyone's like calm again. Yeah. 
laughing. <laughs> but, oh, it's nothing. Yeah. And then, <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like they also do, they do a thing when they're filming this crash sequence, Final Destination, where they keep showing like milk duds rolling on the oh, ground. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To like show like how violent well, everything's no, moving. Which, like, it's pretty clever. Yeah, you know, like you know, people are sitting down and like have seatbelts on, so you can't really tell. You can do but, the Star Trek thing where they're all like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> right? You see yeah. the candy on the ground. We're like, oh. And it, it also, I, I thought it was a good way of appealing to people's emotions, like it's something that people care about, like candy. Yeah, yeah. milk duds. And I was like, oh my god, the milk duds. Someone, oh my god, the wasted milk duds. It's yeah. it's so great too, like seeing the stuff that flies out of the overhead storage compartments. Like I think a guy just gets beamed by a <laughs> by a stereo yeah. system, just <laughs> absolutely torpedoed in the noggin. Uh, uh, but um, I, I think you know that that would happen. Maybe not the stereo system, uh, but yeah, uh, that that would definitely be a fear. Is you know be, uh, overhead compartments opening up and luggage flying around and hitting you. Yeah. But yeah. So then stuff's going crazy, shaking. Suddenly sparks light up in the middle of like the plane like where people are sitting mm -hmm. and like next to the seats almost yeah i don't know if it looked like it was coming from the luggage compartment so I, I i tried to figure that out too and i think they didn't fully connect it i think you know earlier the the passenger when he first boards he like rings the flight attendant call button but mm -hmm. no flight attendant ever comes and i think they were supposed to connect that maybe oh. there was a short circuit in that wiring that yeah. led to sparks that caused a fire the lights definitely flickered and they were doing stuff that was like kind yeah. of forecasting that there was like an electrical issue of some sort right so then uh after the sparks the the walls and seats catch fire pretty quickly uh i'm 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 going to step back here for a second you're talking uh -huh. about the electrical systems we have covered incidents before or i should say accidents before where uh you know there's different electrical systems on a plane there's mm -hmm. like um low voltage and high voltage wiring and we've, we've talked about before when the insulation wears down on some wires sometimes it's possible for high voltage current to arc onto low voltage systems the flight attendant call system and the lights like that would be a low voltage system so theoretically maybe you could get like a high voltage current arcing over to low voltage yeah. wires causing mm -hmm. the kinds of electrical problems that you were seeing there but probably not to this extent. No, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, no, no, so no. I'll continue just quickly detailing what happens. A section of the plane with fire suddenly just like tears apart. Yes. Like it's on fire and all of a sudden just a hole a appears. Hole in the side of the plane. <laughs> out of the side of the plane. And people are getting sucked out of their seats. Um, and then pretty quickly the plane starts to dive uh, down as people are being sucked out the hole. There are sparks in several other areas of the plane as it falls. And then it explodes. Right. Well, they're also like the the dude catches on fire, implying that like fuel got into the yeah, cabin yeah. or something, like, or the oxygen went or something. And then it later the the guy wakes up from his like premonition, mm -hmm. and then he he freaks out, uh, gets other people all you know Riled excited. Stuff, yeah. They get into a fight. People get kicked off the plane. These are the you know main we've characters. All, we've all been there. You know, um, this this obviously happens before. September 11th. Yeah. Because yeah. they're like, you have to take the later flight now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're not immediately blacklisted from the yeah, airlines. Yeah, it's like, oh, with it, the, you're, like, you're not getting arrested, taken to jail. It's like, oh, you're going to have to take, there's another flight to France in three hours. Yeah, so you're going to have yeah. to get on that one. Because the main character wakes up from his dream. It's like, everyone get off the plane. It's going to explode. Like, yeah. There's, and he's like freaking out, telling everyone there's like, the plane's going to explode. Dude, dude would be lucky if an air marshal didn't just take oh, him yeah. down right then yeah. and there. Um, they get kicked off. And then they're like, yelling at each other out in the terminal and then the plane in the background explode like this is like full on explosion giant fireball yeah. that then so powerful that it knocks the breaks the glass the shock wave yeah. you you see the plane explode in the distance and then like a second or two later then the glass and everything <laughs> shock wave hits I like as a kid seeing that that was so cool and it, it felt realistic but how I'm, powerful I'm, would that explosion have to be to shatter all the glass that's like what that. I was wondering yeah, yeah. also also, that glass is probably tempered. Yeah. So it yeah. wouldn't shatter like that. And also, also, it exploded like there was a bomb. Yeah. It looks like, from that explosion, it looked like a bomb. I had been talking to Gus about this, too. And, and maybe it's like they're doing something with the passage of time, like when you're experiencing the thing as it happens in the, in the plane. Uh, it takes longer and stuff like that. But, like... The scene in the plane where the milk duds rolling around and all that stuff, it's like falling apart for like a minute. But mm -hmm. when you see the explosion... It just does it. Well, yeah, yeah he's pops. like, oh, there it goes. The plane's taking off. And then a few seconds later, boom, boom. Yeah. Boom. yeah. The, uh, I will say that we talked about the electrical failure. Um, and there's actually a video uh, I watched um, on Insider or something that had a, a 
air accident investigation branch in the UK, someone who worked in it, who, who, who had a couple comments about this scene. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. And he, he was saying um, that electrical failures don't generally lead to explosions no, <laughs> or no. fireballs. Um, and like, I think he said like in his 35 years of investigating, he'd never, like n- nothing like that had ever No, happened. I think the closest you would get might be like TWA 800. Which, were, which crashed under mysterious circumstances. We did an episode about it where it's possible that an electrical short circuit ignited fuel fumes mm-hmm. in the fuel tanks that caused an explosion. But th- I think that's the working yeah. theory that's most widely accepted. But it's not... It's the way that it happened in this movie is... We not wouldn't yeah. Well, I wouldn't question that guy, that expert, yeah. and you guys on this. But benefit of the doubt, I think they were setting up in a lot of ways that this airplane was a piece of junk. Yeah. And, like, that, like, very possible that, like, fuel lines were ruptured or what have you. Because, like, he even I, at one point pulls the the little switch for the... Uh, the seat back tray? Yeah, yeah. The tray, the seat tray or whatever, and it just, like, pops off. Like, it's falling apart. And they also make the airplane look like Total butt. Yeah, the flaps are uh, are all dirty and yeah. squeaky. So but, interesting thing about the seat back tray. I was that was something I wanted to bring up about this. Oh, if the seat back tray doesn't work like they depicted in that movie, a passenger cannot sit in that seat. Yeah, um, they would mark that seat as unavailable and then find a way to either remove or secure that tray so it can't be deployed down. Mm, duct tape. <laughs> yeah, they might use duct tape for that. Um, but yeah, the electrical failure would probably maybe it might. S- this guy, the the investigator, mm-hmm. he said maybe it could smoke or something. Yeah. It might lead to some smoking or something, or like I, I met like stuff not working, like yeah. the the call button stuff. But the explosion, it, yeah, would not explode. <laughs> yeah, and we've talked about this before that jet fuel by nature is not explosive. Yeah, it would of course catch fire. Um, it wouldn't explode. Fumes, like I did mention earlier, the fumes, the vapor could explode, but not the fuel itself. Yeah. We might have talked about this in the Black Box Down episode that I was on previously where we talked about plane stories, but I went on a Russian flight. It was Aeroflot. (laughs) Aeroflot. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking about this movie. I was looking around. I was like, this is the biggest hunk of junk airplane I've ever been on. The engine looked like it was like going to wobble itself off. The the other thing um, that would in real life would probably happen is they would pass out from... So I actually had, I, I took exception to this. This is one of the things I wrote down. Uh, when the crash is going on, the oxygen masks deploy and, mm-hmm. you know, everyone, and you know, when the, the side of the plane opens up, it decompresses and people fly out. This plane isn't very high. There would be no need, one, there'd be no need for oxygen to deploy. Two, the pressure differential would not be so great that there would be a decompression like that and people would get sucked out. Mm. They, they were definitely under 10,000 feet. It just happened right after takeoff. They probably were only, if I took a guess, three to 4,000 feet above the ground, if that. Well, I guess... It, it, it looks it, dramatic. Yeah, in, yeah. The, in, the, uh, in the... From the airport uh, perspective, it seems like they're not very high up at all, but right. if, you, if you watch the, the premonition, the first version of the scene, it seems like they'd be a lot higher up right. because they, you, know, you see them take off, they go up, then there's turbulence, then they... Su- like that seems like but be- it, it's still not even that high. Like if you think about it, you know, when you're in the plane, like let's say you're a passenger on a plane, even getting to 10,000 feet where you hear the ding mm-hmm. where you can recline your seatbelt, that takes 20 minutes maybe mm. uh, yeah. to get to that point. You know, they're definitely, they're, I, I will say they're definitely under 10,000 feet. Okay. So there would be no need for uh, oxygen masks or any type of decompression like that. I also noticed on the oxygen mask things, those things deployed. And I feel like there's like a reservoir like bag filled with air or something or with oxygen or something, but they were all deflated. Like, was that inaccurate? Did you notice that at that, all? That's possible that it wouldn't inflate uh, depending on the pressure you're at. Sometimes it would inflate, sometimes it wouldn't. They were low, so I think not inflating would be correct in this case. Okay, all right. Um, I think it was probably lazy filmmaking, but it just happened to yeah. be what I think was at, factual. At a higher altitude, it, it's more likely to uh, inflate. Is it kind of like the same effect, like you buy a bag of potato chips and you take them up to the Rocky yeah, Mountains I, and it I was fills exactly, up? Exactly, okay. exactly. Yeah, it's always weird, you're like, you have a a bag of potato yeah and it just like you, it also it also happens on a plane you know if you if you buy a bag of potato chips in the terminal before you take off and don't open it you want to, and wait till you get to cruising altitude it's really filled with a lot yeah. of uh, <laughs> airplane lot of bottles or air. water bottles are the same where it's just like like all bloated mm-hmm. yeah i think there there are 
rules when it comes to flying about when if you're in a, a like a non-pressurized plane there are rules about when you have to use oxygen or when you have to supply it to passengers and i want to say a pilot does not have to use oxygen unless they spend more than 30 minutes above 12,500 feet then they have to use it uh then at once above 15,000 feet they have to use it the entire time then they have to make it available to passengers they don't have to force their passengers to use it they just have to make sure it's available uh so you can you can go pretty high without mm. needing oxygen so all that to say under 10,000 mm-hmm. feet they definitely those oxygen masks would probably not have deployed so i was going to say i've been uh skydiving before Mm -hmm. and we went up high but not like 747 like commercial airliner high but we never had to use yeah you you don't use oxygen we both been we went yeah yeah skydiving together yeah um and you're just in the cockpit it's like whenever you fly your cessnas i guess i wasn't thinking about breathing i was just thinking about falling jumping out of (laughs) (laughs) um i had a few more nitpicks okay about this movie um, I, I was impressed. They they board the plane, mm-hmm. and you can't really tell what kind of plane it is. It looks like a 747 from what you can see based on like looking from the terminal. Um, they go, they go into the plane, and the interior when they're filming it, dual aisle plane, just like a 747 would be. And the economy class is laid out in a 343 three seat configuration, which tracks with how the the interior most likely would be with a 747. Mm-hmm. However, when the main character is walking down to his seat. He sits down, and you can see there's a wall right behind him, indicating he's like in the last row of the plane. Uh-huh. But he's in row 25. Oh, yeah. A 747 would go to like row 50 or 60. Well, okay. So, and I've been on planes. Don't they have the bathrooms? Right, but they show from another angle that there's a galley right there, and there's a wall. If like, I had, to, it's the very back of the plane. If I had to take a guess from a production standpoint, if they were going to shoot in that middle thing, either they didn't have the set built for that. Or they didn't want to fill the back with extras. That, I guess that's what it is. That, yeah. yeah, I bet, yeah. Uh, like, they, they, they could keep the set smaller and then not have to pay so many extras to do that. Yeah. Um, also, uh, he reaches up to, you know, he's nervous uh-huh. about the flight and everything. He reaches up to turn on his air, the little air vent, but he turns it to the right. Oh, right. Tidy lefty loose. Exactly. It's the oldest trick in the book. He turned it the wrong way. Hey, you're wonder, really watching this with like I wonder, a microscope. <laughs> I wonder if they like... Listen, I'm going to ruin any airplane <laughs> in the movie for you like it's ruined for me. I wonder if... I, I, actually, I didn't notice that. I wonder if it was like reversed or something. He actually doesn't even touch it. He just puts his hand up there and acts like he's touching it. Oh, weird. Oh. Uh, and then does it, they add the sound of the... <laughs> oh. Yeah. Why didn't... That's, that's weird. Because you didn't notice. I, you're, yeah. not, you're not like me where an airplane ruins a movie for you. <laughs> The center overhead bins were props. Like, they didn't look like they could open and hold anything. Mm, uh-huh. uh, the overhead bins on the side, appropriate size. The ones in the center, way too small, especially for a 747. <laughs> I, I can't get the vision out of that dude getting beamed with that so, stereo. I rewatched watched it a few times. It's so funny. <laughs> it's Because it's such a weird, oblong-shaped radio like they used to do in the, the early 2000s. <laughs> Just... Sorry. Uh, yeah, and then some of the other stuff we talked about, the flickering lights, the oxygen deploying, the fire in the cabin. Then another, oh, the, the glass shattering in the airport. Mm. Uh, then one, one final thing that I thought was strange was after the dream sequence, when the main character wakes up and he starts screaming, plane's going to blow up, we mm-hmm. got to get off, whatever. And then like they restrain him and take him off the plane. The cabin crew person who takes him off the plane uh, and who's there with the police uh, is wearing like a pilot's uniform, but has only one stripe on his shoulder. Oh, the guy with the oh. like, really, really cool hair? Did he have cool hair? I don't remember. There was but, a guy that had like bangs. They're like really like middle part long. No, that wasn't him. Okay, think. sorry. Uh, and then uh, he's the person who uh, the teacher's like, one of us has to be on the plane. Yeah. Uh, they're going to France. He's like, okay, only one of you. And then like he turns around and walks back on the plane. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a pilot. Right, but he only has one stripe on his shoulder. So, okay, so that's just a uh, uniform. Four stripes is a captain. Uh-huh. Three stripes is a first officer. Two stripes is not really used anymore. Typically, it would be like a navigator or a second officer. Uh-huh. One stripe, I think that's like a pilot in training, or maybe depending on the airline, sometimes a flight attendant might be allowed to wear one stripe. It's just a very weird huh. costume detail that they added, yeah. and I don't know why they only gave him one stripe. And he did claim it's my flight, right. so it was implying he was the yeah. captain. So that little bit of trivia for you, if you don't know that, if you ever see a pilot. Uh, four stripes, four you know, gold stripes means that they're the captain. And then three, I salute them. Right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> three, three means first officer. I would also imagine if whatever he, he like goes with them off the plane, I would imagine security would just take them off. Yeah, he goes off with them along with the police, I believe. Yeah. And yeah. The, they're there. And then what I thought was crazy, just 
Well, that the pl- I, I would imagine if someone did this, would the plane even take off at that point? Yeah, I think you so. Think so? Might be if delayed, someone you yelled, it's that. gonna. Exp- it's really yeah. yeah. And you, you can't. There's no accounting for that. Some other people may have also walked off the plane. People who are nervous flyers. Yeah. Uh, I imagine that would probably happen. But yeah, the plane would definitely. Well, they did have one person. Uh, th- That's th- true. They had one one of the girls. Um, the, the one that the the girl that carries the remainder of the franchise. She's in like every oh, other Final she? Destination <laughs> movie, I think. Yeah. Um, and then. Afterwards, after it does explode, they're like getting interrogated by the FBI. Which it, oh, I forgot that element. Yeah, yeah. Which I just thought was they were like he's like I just had a dream or felt like it was gonna you know got nervous and he and they I guess he just they just let him go. <laughs> I don't know what they can <laughs> do, is, but I feel like they would like arrest him or something. Again, this movie took place before For, September 11th. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so different, different world, different time. Well, what would, what would the timeline of the investigation look like? And would they release him from custody? Would they even take him in? Like, what would that even? They would be? probably, you know, the FBI would question him. Uh, the NTSB would come out to do their investigation. They'd probably want to talk to them fairly quickly. Mm. Uh, I, you know, depends however long it takes the NTSB to get there. I assume within the next twenty four hours, he he would be expected to be interviewed by uh, actual uh, accident investigators. Not for criminal prosecution, but for, you know, uh, accident out. investigation purposes. Yeah. Well, it's a fun uh, little horror movie. I, very, very kind of 2000s oh, absolutely. cheese. Yeah. But the glass shattering, it's like <laughs> my favorite part of the. When I think of Final Destination, I think of the plane exploding, the shockwave, and then the glass exploding. But then I was also thinking about like those, that glass has to be super thick because it's resisting like airplane engines right, yeah. running and noise and you don't really hear it outside so that's like heavy duty glass there's no right. way it would have exploded all the vibrations that it has to uh, yeah. Yeah. stand up to that would have to be like a, like a nuclear blast in the sky for it to go like really close yeah ruined this episode of black box down sponsored by better help getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process i think a lot of us can remember feeling like you had everything figured out by 18 or 20 only to later look back and feel like you actually knew nothing about yourself at that time That feeling doesn't only come up in early adulthood because we're constantly growing and changing throughout our entire lives. And therapy can be a great tool for gaining a deeper understanding of yourself no matter what stage of life you're in because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. Therapy can also be a great tool for learning positive coping skills, learning how to set boundaries, and empowering you to be the best version of yourself. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option that's convenient, flexible, and entirely online. Plus, you can choose sessions that are suited to your schedule, so you can fit it in wherever works best for you. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and if you want, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash BlackBoxDown today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash BlackBoxDown. If you think an e-bike can't handle your haul, think again. Whether you're hauling groceries, gear, or even an extra passenger, the all-new Expedition e-bike has you covered. This new cargo e-bike is designed to carry more so you can do more and enjoy the fresh air in the meantime. Uh, I love this uh, the Expedition uh, bike. I've got one myself. You fit so much cargo on the back. It's got so many great features. It's super convenient, amazing range. You can go real fast, and if you're a lazy bum like me, you can let the electric motor do all the work. I find myself looking for any excuse possible to use it. I think this bike's amazing. It does everything I could possibly want from it. So whether from quick store trips to outdoor adventures, electric e-bikes will transform how you get around. Electric e-bikes also cost way less than the competition with quality feature-packed models financed as low as $133 per month. They include a powerful removable battery, a bright LCD display, seven-speed gearing, and five levels of pedal assist to power your ride. Plus, you can lower your gas costs and reduce your carbon footprint. Electric e-bikes are also customizable and adjustable to fit your lifestyle. Best part is, once you've decided on the perfect e-bike for you, shipping's free and it's delivered to your door fully assembled. I cannot stress that enough. You just unpack it and then it's already assembled. You don't have to worry. You don't have to bust out tools. You just unfold it and it's ready to go. You don't have to take my word for it. There's a growing community of over 250,000 dedicated riders on the road so far. Right now, you can check out the all-new Expedition Cargo e-bike from Electric. Visit electricebikes.com to learn more about the Expedition Cargo e-bike and all of the other sweet models Electric has to offer. That's L-E-C-T-R-I-C-E-B-I-K-S dot com. Hey, everyone. Did you know this year is Rooster Teeth's 20th anniversary? That's right. Whether you've been with us for 20 years or 20 days, we couldn't have gotten here without your support. So... 
to show our appreciation, we're making 20 special anniversary episodes from some of your favorite shows to celebrate our 20-year history. Best part is, they're all mystery surprise videos. Every Friday, a mystery video will be available on roosterteeth.com just for first members, and the title of the video will be revealed on Saturday and then made available for everyone the following week. Uh, we love giving out surprises, but we couldn't keep everything secret for the whole 20 weeks of anniversary episodes. So to kick off our anniversary, we'll tell you what four of the episodes are going to be. So get excited for new special episodes of Rage Quit. I think that one actually just came out. Chump, Master and Apprentice, and Camp Camp. That's all you get for now. So, well, I guess you also know that Awu was the first one, but that's it. So tune in to roosterteeth.com every week to see what the other episodes will be. Maybe your favorite series will return. Maybe it won't. Hey, only one way to find out. So again, we're so thankful for your support these last 20 years. We hope that you're as excited as we are to see the return of these awesome shows. Well, shall we jump to uh, Commando? Commando. Let's party. I loved this movie when I was a kid. I, uh, yeah. That's so, not Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's Blaine. <laughs> Sorry. Just yeah, so yeah, everyone knows. Uh, we didn't get special guests on Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, yeah, this was like knee-jerk reaction. I was like, okay. You guys asked me beyond what can I do? What's what's a Schwarzenegger movie? And then I was like, oh, Commando. Yeah. It's actually so basically what happens is the plot of the movie is uh there's this guy, he's like a retired uh Commando? No, he's like a colonel or something like that. He's like uh -huh. higher up in rank and he used to lead this team of special forces dudes. And at the beginning of the movie, they all get dead. And uh, <laughs> and and then this dude shows up to his house, he's like, ah, John Matrix, they're they're after you. Long story short, they take his uh, John daughter. John Matrix is Arnold Schwarzenegger. John Maker, yeah. They take John Matrix's daughter, they kidnap her, and then they say, we need you to assassinate uh, a leader in this foreign country who trusts you, and then we're going to stage a coup, uh, and you're the only guy that we can trust to go in there and kill him, and if you don't do it, we're going to kill your daughter. So they kind of set a ticking clock, which I thought was actually pretty brilliant for like a whatever 80s action movie, where um, they put... Arnold, John Matrix, on an airplane to go to this foreign country, and it's an 11-hour flight, uh, and he needs to escape the flight because he wants to go save his daughter because he doesn't trust these guys. He knows he's going to kill their, his daughter. So um, Played by Alyssa Milano, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a weird cast. So they uh, he escapes the flight, which we'll get into, uh, and then it's like the ticking clock is when the flight is going to land to on the other side they'll realize that john matrix is on the loose right. and that they need to kill his daughter because he you know he's going after them or something right um so yeah basically uh after all the kidnapping and all this stuff they've got john matrix held hostage and uh he's like being escorted around by all these thugs and there's this one thug who is going to be with him on the airplane so they didn't want to spring a lot of money for extra tickets so <laughs> well, i only bought one <laughs> well yeah but also like okay really quick stepping out of this i don't know we'll get into it later so uh they board the airplane uh they sit down and then you know arnold's like looking at the window and in the door and he's like trying to figure out his escape plan and uh he subtly kills this guy by breaking his neck and then covering he, up he like elbows him and then breaks his neck yeah yeah he he asks the flight attendant for a blanket and a pillow she leaves he like elbows him knocks him unconscious then breaks his neck then props him up against the corner of the window with the pillow and the blanket and then puts his hat over his head and then of course he says to the flight attendant don't wake up my friend he's dead tired yeah <laughs> uh, i also was the fact that they they put that one dude to like to keep an Arnold. eye on Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, that guy, he, yeah. yeah, he would last about as long as he did in the movie. Right, but also he he made him get the window seat, and Arnold was the row seat, which I thought was, well, like, weird strategy. Also, when they board the plane, I'm glad you say this, when they board the plane, the flight attendant tells Arnold, seat 7A, Yeah, your friend's in 7B, but then the guy who's watching him sits in 7A, leaving <laughs> Arnold in 7B. Yeah. Like, the, the, the tickets that they were given were the correct, were the safer way. I also like that when they're boarding, they're like, uh, do you have any, uh, do you have any baggage? And he's like, uh, just him. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, pull that again. I'll staple your mouth shut. Uh, so it kills the guy. Um, he, the plane is already taking off at this point. So then he goes to the back and he tells the flight attendant that he's about to poop his pants. Uh, and then he goes into the, like, would, I guess the service elevator. They would have stopped the plane at that point. Were they really? Passengers cannot be up walking around. Okay. Well, that's, uh, he says he's air sick and they're still on the ground. Which I thought was a really so stupid, so, so dumb. <laughs> yeah. So then he takes this cargo, like I guess, service elevator down into the 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 bottom part of the uh, the airplane fuselage. Uh, opens up a door. There's a big barking dog, and the uh, 
the cargo lock up and it starts barking at him, which if you're going to lock up your dog on a flight, like don't, don't, don't take, don't take your dogs on flights unless you have like a little seat for them. Yeah. Don't, don't put them in the cargo. I hole. saw an Instagram video the other day of a, like a golden retriever asleep in first class. Like someone got a ticket for it. It's just like, Hey man, laid out in a bed, taking a nap. Like do it, do that. <laughs> don't, don't, your dog's not baggage. He, don't wake my friend. He's dog tired. He's dog tired. <laughs> so he, he journeys his way back and then he reaches this like rubber wall. And I actually want to talk to you about this. He, it's like, I guess a, is it a pressurization thing? Yes. I was actually, this is one of the things I wanted to talk about. So he, Arnold puts his arm through this like rubber, uh, like door thing, and he rips it open. Did you read what the door said? Do not open. Do not open during flight. And he's opening it during <laughs> the flight. Uh, then he, because he opens this thing up, he gets access to the landing gear, and the landing gear hasn't gone up into the plane yet. It's still taking off from the runway, so then he climbs down, and then he's like going however fast it is for an airplane to take off, and then he jumps into a marsh at the end of the runway, and he's fine. He's fine. Uh, the uh, I, I I looked this up. the the plane The kind of plane they're on is a DC ten. Mm -hmm. uh, rotation speed, which is the speed at which they begin climbing, like they begin taking off, like leaving the runway, is about one hundred sixty six knots, which is one hundred ninety one miles an hour. So Arnold takes a one hundred ninety one mile per hour jump. Like, and and at this point, they show the plane up in the air, and I know it's all visual effects, and it's not. They didn't actually do this, but when he jumps off the plane, it's probably a couple hundred feet in the air. Right. So he's going minimum 200 miles an hour <laughs> yeah. from a couple hundred feet in the air and then just kind of like lands in a marsh and just kind of brushes yeah, it yeah. off. Yeah, he lands in some bushes and, and some he, water. Yeah, and he's pretty high up. Yeah. Like, but it's, also, <laughs> it's, and he just kind of, the way he falls, it looks, it's just kind of like, uh, it's like if you were to make your body into like a C shape, like you're like <laughs> yeah. going full speed into the, your couch or something. Um, but yeah, the the shot, the wide shot where he lands in the marsh it's so ridiculous because it's clear that they have like a ladder or a crane just <laughs> off frame and that's what he jumped off. There's no real speed. Yeah. Because I mean, the guy's coming down with force and then he's just like, ah, like just floats <laughs> to the ground. Uh, also, that's filmed at LAX. That was LAX airport. There's mm -hmm. no marsh around there. <laughs> yeah, I don't like, know where the water would have like, been. Yeah, you might fall onto like a, a, a freeway. <laughs> is there not though? I mean, okay, think about it. This is the mid 80s and i know that they have like all those like oil fields and and stuff out there did none of that surround that area has it changed a marsh though no that that's yeah. like it was like florida or something well i, yeah. I know the, the area you're talking about that's like a little north of the airport um i believe they were getting to south america for this assassination yeah so most likely they, they would be taking off and then turning down to the south away from that so and they're still going to be really close to the airport, even if they're only a couple hundred feet off the ground. It would be like immediately that area right around there. Because doesn't yeah, don't you see the airport still right like right in the background when after he jumps? Yeah. Out? Well, yeah. no. When he gets out of the marsh, he then runs through the airport, and then he runs into a flight attendant yeah. and the other and Sully, who's another character. Uh, so he's like in the proximity of the airport still. Yeah. So it's still that would be really cl oh, close to the airport. That's my other favorite part. He jumps out of this plane going like high speeds gets onto the runway and then he runs back to the terminal there's a dude just running around LAX yeah. turn, like <laughs> runway planes are like <laughs> like a hundred feet away from him and he's just like jogging in like he's doing the worst stealth job ever I mean let's be honest like Arnold would be a terrible spy because he sticks out like a sore thumb yeah a big muscular sore big thumb big <laughs> lumpy sore <laughs> thumb um, but yeah so then he gets back into the airport but uh, something else that I think you commented on is they get in on the airplane on the, like the, if you're facing the airplane, the left side. Correct. They get in the airplane opposite from where you, you would board. normally board a plane. They right. get it from like where the truck would load the galley. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. And then they cross, and then she tells them seat 7A. So they cross across the entire plane to the correct side uh -huh. and seat. But I think. You know, when they should have probably boarded right behind where they were sitting. And I, the only thing I can think is, again, it's like a filmmaking thing where they wanted Arnold to be able to look over his right shoulder and keep an eye on the door mm -hmm. that was closing. It definitely felt like they were trying to prevent jumping the line uh, when you're filmmaking to, you know, make continuity make sense. There's like a line that you kind of establish and you don't cross that line. The camera doesn't cross that line because then it's just like, oh, where am I geographically? So like it was between between that and then I think also like maybe the airplane they couldn't get like the actual terminal connection or maybe they did but they couldn't film that so 
coverage wise it made more sense for them to have a stairwell from the there was probably also just maybe a set for the interior mm-hmm. sure um but it's still it's it's weird it might have been a coverage thing maybe the other side of the set didn't look as good yeah. or they're like we want to film on this side and i don't know the the elevator well before he's the <laughs> elevator him breaking his neck that dude's neck he rocks yeah their entire row of seats you're telling me that no one noticed that guy just get rocked their, their back is up to like the galley or a bathroom though uh-huh. so there's like nobody sitting right behind them but it cuts hey, to a wider that's, shot that, that's that's a noticing a a, a theme here <laughs> it's just easier to shoot that <laughs> yeah they're always up against the wall yeah, yeah. but it, there's like it, it cuts to a wider shot after he breaks the dude's neck and it's like this like older couple but like not old enough that they can't hear yeah mm-hmm. uh and they just they just don't even notice that arnold just broke a man's neck he could have at least like fake coughed <laughs> yeah, yeah like oh, just, oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry my, but, my drink opened. Oh, a, oops. Uh, but yeah, the elevator, though, is that like, what was, I mean, I don't, and Gus, you know better, but like, those aren't accessible to, if they're, I've never heard of an elevator in a plane, but they wouldn't be accessible to just anyone. This right? is something I wanted to bring up and talk about. This deck galley that they show for this plane is incredibly authentic. Really? I think oh. that they actually did film, going back on what I said earlier, I think they actually did film on a plane. I don't think it's a set. Mm. Uh, because uh, I've never been in the deck galley, but I looked up photos of the deck galley for a DC-10, and they it looks just like that. Either they made a set look identical how it should look, or more likely, they actually filmed in the plane. Um, because in this plane, this, this was the level where they would heat up and prepare the food, and then put it onto a cart, and then take it up oh. to, uh, to serve to everyone else on the plane. Uh, and there were avionics in there as well. This This deck looked exactly how it did in real life wow uh, i didn't know so they actually have elevators the, the, the dc 10 did yeah. i knew that there's multiple floors but yeah i always assumed that it was stairs is how they access yeah, some, them some planes do have small elevators uh depending you know what you need to do but this one was this one was very authentic i, I guess thought. like like footprint wise an elevator would make more sense than stairs or a, a ladder because like ladder then you get into accessibility problems right. for crew and stuff especially but, if you're moving carts uh carts that makes perfect sense why they would have it instead of an elevator then or yeah. as, as staircase. Stairs. Uh, also the, uh, the the thing you talked about that do not open during flight seal to yeah. get to the landing gear again i've never been in the internals of a dc-10 but based on the fact they were shooting inside the deck galley I'm going to bet that they were also filming uh, around actual uh, landing gear. It mm-hmm. looked very authentic to mm-hmm. me, uh, what I did see. Not that I know much about the DC-10 innards. So I bet that was some kind of pressure seal well, when they were at altitude. So, okay. But thinking back, though, he's on the front of the airplane. Mm-hmm. So then, but the way that they shoot it, it makes it look like he's going back. I thought, maybe he, went towards, to the, I thought he went to the back of the plane. Yeah. To when but, he was to the bathroom. Right, but okay. So I think that's why they they came they boarded the direction they did so that he could have a place to go when he Well, so they board near the front. He goes to the back, takes the elevator down. So I guess it's assumed that he then journeys back to the front of the plane to get oh, on the front landing. Oh, I assume it looked like he was gear. like going back further to the back. Yeah, or but I think he's on the front landing. Gear. He might have gone back only to the middle of the plane, then got down there. I don't uh-huh. know where the sur- where the service galley elevator was on yeah. the DC-10. Uh, so you might not have gotten all the way back. So, okay, but either way, though, he rips that thing that says do, do not open during flight. Right. That would have caused a pressurization thing, and that would have alerted the cockpit, right? Well, so either one of two things. Either he caused a crash or... Uh, <laughs> it's oh, like he's, like, like walking away, like, ha, 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 and then the plane explosion. explodes, like, in final <laughs> destination. Uh, or, more, or more likely, it just causes warnings to go off in the cockpit that the plane's not pressurized and correctly. Then they would have landed the plane promptly but discovered there's a dead body (laughs) well spoiler alert later on they actually do land the plane and then there's a couple of other thugs to meet them at the end of the flight and then they oh god they did this guy so dirty they pull a uh the the body bag open or a blanket that's covering the dead body and he looks like a ghoul like they painted him gray and he's like he looks horrifying uh but they make the they make the trip yes without issue right aside from escorting a dead body um so this specific plane was a dc-10 like i said uh-huh. um and it this plane that they filmed the exteriors of and presumably the interiors in um uh, was operated by an airline called western airlines which ceased operations in 1987 two years after commando came out uh it fo- got folded into delta uh delta airlines and the plane that they used for this 
was delivered to Western Airlines in 1973, got sold to American Airlines or gets transferred to American Airlines in April 1985. So presume this was probably towards the end of Western Airlines using it when they filmed it and then transferred it out to American Airlines. Then American Airlines uh, traded it off to FedEx in June of 1999. Are you talking about this specific? This specific plane. This, wow, you tracked down the I, specific plane. This is the hell I live in. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know. Uh, FedEx never actually painted this plane or flew it. They just bought it for parts. And oh, they okay. cannibalized the plane for parts for just other like, DC-10s that they operated. Yeah, like I wonder a, if they ever recognized This back cockpit thing was torn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a dead dog in the cargo hold. <laughs> Uh, haunted uh, by a thug from uh, this, whatever. Um, wow. Okay. Uh, okay. Lots so, of times in, in movies, you can see either the tail numbers or serial numbers, especially around the nose uh, nose wheel uh -huh. when those the doors open for the uh, nose landing gear, uh, and you can look up those numbers. Uh, this, sometimes with older movies, it's difficult to find, uh, just because records weren't as weren't digital back then. Uh, but I was able to track down this one. So uh, there's another airplane sequence that happens in Commando as well. Uh, so like I said, he goes back to the airport, which I guess is LAX, and he meets a flight attendant. And the flight attendant just so happens to be training to be a pilot. And uh, she hears his story about his kidnapped daughter. She at one point rats him out at a mall and all this stuff. But then she joins him and she's like, I'm going to help you find your daughter. So they steal, what's the proper term? A seaplane? A seaplane. They steal a seaplane together after it getting just riddled with bullets by these dudes on a jeep, and uh, they take off in just a marina or whatever. And uh, she's like not super certain because she only flies Cessnas and she's never fl right. flown a seaplane. But Arnold seems to know his, John Matrix seems to know his way around yeah, this plane he's really like, well. Yeah, he he's the, they're about to crash into stuff, and he's like. I got it. Yeah, you know, just it's like, gonna. We're gonna hit those boats. And he's like, "No, we're not." And then he <laughs> pushes like more the, throttle. Yeah. Oh, he just and it like the plane goes <laughs> like it's. I'm surprised he didn't blow an engine. Yeah. Um. But also, why was I, I've never flown a seaplane? But why was she not taking off? If she's flown Cessnas, which I have flown, why is she not taking off at full power already to begin with? Yeah. Normally, it's like you give it everything to get. Yeah. Up into the air. She, 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 because they needed Arnold to, yeah, to, <laughs> to do, do something. Also, also, she yeah. didn't pull out a checklist to start that plane. Well, there was a Jeep with a bunch of, they were being dudes. shot. Yeah, at, but she's yeah. like, I don't know how to start it. I've never flown. It's like, look for the checklist. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she wasn't thinking straight because her life was in danger. Uh, and she was being kidnapped by this beautiful man. Um, I, I also noticed too that, uh, in that movie, gas like fuel is never a concern mm -mm. and she flies him like from that marina to wherever this like coastal place is that he does this you know brutal uh killing spree at and then she later on picks him up and then they fly off again together even though the military is there to help them out um yeah no fuel is just like it's just like bullets in that movie it's yeah. just not it's plentiful yeah don't ever have to think plentiful. about it they don't really seem to matter yeah <laughs> Uh, so that's that again. This specific plane was a Grumman Goose. Uh, it was built in 1942. She did say this thing looks older than me, but it's like that's not unreasonable. Yeah. Like you fly a 1970 something yeah, or another. Yeah. It's old. Uh, but yeah, this at the time this movie was filmed, this was what like a 43 year old plane, 42, 43 year old plane. It's pretty old. It's pretty old. Um, and this specific plane was actually sadly destroyed in a hangar fire in 1999. Ooh. So uh, this plane no longer exists in either. 1999. Yeah. That might have been the fire from Final Destination. Oh. <laughs> We're going to connect it all into the, the same black box down universe. <laughs> we covered a, an incident with uh, a seaplane similar uh, to this um, Grumman Goose. I believe the one we covered was a Grumman Mallard, uh, the Chalks Ocean Air yeah. uh, crash. And that specific seaplane that we covered in that episode uh, was a very famous plane. That plane had been in like Miami Vice. It was in the George Michael Careless Whisper music video. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. uh, like very it's a celebrity iconic. amongst planes. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a very well known plane. Uh, it, and then we we did a we did an episode where we just talked about plane seaplanes. Yeah, we did. Which is a fun, I like that. I like seaplanes. I mean, seaplanes are cool. Yeah. Like how versatile of an aircraft, you know? Like, yeah. You can just land wherever as long as there's water. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I like how she called it. Uh, another thing that bothered me is like she, they're going up to these docks and there's like all these boats. You know, you see all these masts and stuff clearly. And she's like, then they finally see the airplane. She's like, this isn't a plane. This is a canoe with wings. And it's like you're at a marina. Like, yeah. Going, yeah. <laughs> what did you, yeah. What did you What did you expect <laughs> to find here? <laughs> Was there a runway somewhere nearby? Oh, that's really funny. Yeah, uh, it's a great movie though. I love I love Commando. Lots of 
uh, like murder? very action movie one liners. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. I mean yeah. that's just Schwarzenegger in that era. And, but I think yeah. this movie is like peak of that. Like yeah. the the Schwarzenegger one liners. Um, I mean I think they were like, man, whoever wrote it was like. We should just have a movie where we just give Arnold a bunch of one-liners and just string it together with whatever plot. I, like, Commando. I, Commando's one of the few movies that I think I could probably just like. I, so, okay, so to set up the scene, you guys asked me to be on. I said Commando. Uh, I have a TV up in my office by all my other like crafting stuff. So I was like sewing curtains while watching Commando, yeah. which felt like the two weirdest things. <laughs> like this super ultra masculine movie and I'm just like sewing curtains for my girlfriend. Um, awesome. But I I couldn't look away. I can't. I kept it just like, it was just... Curtains turned out terrible. Yeah, like, they were like, but, <laughs> but I kept quoting the movie because it's just so quotable and fun. Absolutely. And that soundtrack. Oh, the steel drums. Oh, yeah. That, ding, 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 ding. Great movie. So, uh, so I, I, if we want to move on to yeah. the last movie, I, I, I wanted to talk about Airplane, which is a movie I've been avoiding every other time we did these. Yeah. Uh, just because I knew it was going to be super dense with a lot to talk about. Oh, yeah. And it is. Uh, so, we came out, like I said, in 1980. Um, very. For me, a very influential movie as far as like my, uh, I watched it when I was very young, very influential as far as like shaping my sense of humor and like comedic timing sensibilities. I think some parts of that movie, were, <laughs> if they remade that movie today, some parts of it would probably be omitted or done oh, yeah. or done differently. It's definitely a movie of that time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting watching the intro to that movie because they show like the airplane and everyone arriving to the airport. Just like seeing, it's almost like a graveyard of airlines mm -hmm. that they show at the beginning, like there's signs for Hughes Air West, Continental, Eastern Airlines, TWA, like none of those airlines <laughs> exist anymore. Uh, I bet it took you seven hours to watch that one movie. Just, it took me a pause. long time. Yeah. I kept pausing it uh, to write stuff down. Uh, one of the first gags for the film is like, you know, people are coming up to the airport and parking and you hear voices like the white zones for loading and unload, unloading. There's no parking in the red zone. And it's like a man and a woman. And like the, the announcers begin arguing with each other about <laughs> where you can park and where you can't park. Those were actually the voices at LAX at the time that Whoa, did the announcements. What? Yeah, they found the actual man and woman who were married in real life. Oh, what? Yeah, and had them record the, the announcements for Airplane. So if you flew out of LAX at the time, it must have been really weird because you were probably used to hearing those announcements be like, Whoa, what? That is That's incredible. Wild. Yeah. Uh, that is crazy it's a weird and they were married trivia. yeah they're married to each other in real life they have great voices this movie this movie rocks yeah at the real airport at the time at lax the white zone was for loading and unloading of passengers only and there was no stopping in the red zone except for transit buses i had to look it up <laughs> one of the other early gags is you know walking through the airport and they, re they revisit this gag later and there's all the people handing out flowers or mm -hmm. wanting to talk to you about religion. Yeah, like religious folks, yeah. Right, and they say, some of them say they're with the Religious Consciousness Church, other ones say they're with the Church of Religious Consciousness, um, and that's very much a reference to Harry Krishnas, mm -hmm. who used to do that um, quite a bit at the time, and they were actually the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, mm. which is why they kept giving them these confusing names. Uh, they used to solicit in airports. They would give you a flower and then ask for a donation. They weren't the only one. There were also the Moonies and a bunch of other religious organizations. Oh, and the Moonies. So really quick on that, uh, they were allowed on the terminal because there wasn't a security line and you well, didn't have to have a flight. Before 9-11, you could just walk. Up I remember as a kid. You could just go straight up could, to the terminal. You could go up to like, yeah, where people would board mm -hmm. and then wait for them to to get off the plane. You still have to go through security, but yeah, you could get to but the you gate. could go through. So theoretically, you could just hang out at the airport. Yeah. That's so strange. I guess that, yeah, no, uh, Big Trouble in Little China did that. You, they go right up to where she lands. So, But uh, there, there was actually a very long lawsuit uh, between the uh, Hare Krishnas and the various state and federal governments about whether or not they could legally solicit uh, donations the way they did at airports. Because mm -hmm. even if they couldn't go to the gate, you could think they could solicit on the public side of security. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, the, the, First Amendment kind of thing. Right, exactly. And the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately ruled against them in a 6-3 decision saying that airports are not a public forum and not protected under the First Amendment. Interesting. Mm, interesting. Uh, Did so, that set a precedent for anything else other than religious stuff? Like, I don't know. That's a good question. I only, I only looked at it in this very narrow scope. Yeah, sure. Uh, but yeah, this, this, and this was over many, many years. I, I, I read up on this. Like They went state by state. They had, had lawsuits in New York, had lawsuits mm -hmm. in California, and uh, like ultimately it all went to the Supreme Court, and you know, they were like, yeah, I mean, this 
no further no other place you can yeah. go. Uh, another interesting little tidbit I thought, like watching this opening scene when everyone's walking around. I don't know if you all ever no- realize this, but no one has any luggage with wheels on it. Everyone's carrying all their luggage. Suitcases and hmm. stuff. Yeah. Right. Uh, because really, wheeled suitcases didn't exist yet. Mm. Like, they hadn't been invented, which is, <laughs> I see Chris's face. It's a really bizarre thing to think about. So I looked up the history of the wheel suitcase wow. as a tangent to, uh, to this. You must have spent a long time watching it this It took movie. about seven hours to watch this movie. It's, a, it's a, like an 85-minute long movie. It took me like seven hours That's to get through awesome. it. I, so that, that is cra- I never thought about that. Because Please, I want to know when, <laughs> when, were the, when was the wheel invented? Yeah, 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 yeah. Tell us about wheeled suitcase. I have so many questions now. So, so this movie came out in 1980. It started actually in 1970. It was uh, Bernard Sadow invented or uh yeah a traditional suitcase on wheels attached to a long strap uh but it was it took a very long time for this to catch on because it's just like a guy doing this and in 1972 he patented this invention as rolling luggage um and it wasn't until 1987 that robert plath updated sato's design by placing the suitcase vertically like we think of them now uh attaching two wheels and building a retractable handle which we all that's like no. That's like that's just how suitcases are. Well, still so really quick. I used to work at Samsonite and I used to sell luggage in high school, and they did have that original design where it was a suitcase. It was basically laying uh, horizontally, and it had a little like ribbon of mm-hmm. rope that that was what you, you used pulled to it. drag. Mm. And I always thought it was the strangest looking thing, but I guess that was the original rolling suitcase. Right. That's that, like they, it was the the evolution of it. It's like you look at like the evolution of man. Like yeah, you, it like, starts to stand <laughs> slowly up, right? starts to stand up, and now it's on four wheels. <laughs> right. And, and <laughs> with, a, with, a, with, a, with a retractable pole. Yeah, yeah. So this one we're talking about here. What are we just talked about? The vertical suitcase with two wheels and a retractable handle. This didn't come out till seven years after the movie. Oh Whoa. wow! So the movie was 18, 1980. This was nineteen eighty seven. And then in 1989, demand for Plath's trademark rollerboard became so high, he moved operations from his garage to a warehouse. Mm. Just to put in perspective the scale we're talking about here. So 1989, up till 1989, he's still working out of his garage. He was Etsy at that point. Right. (laughs) Uh, And in 1991, Plath retired from from his airline job to pursue Travel Pro, which is a a suitcase manufacturer. It's the parent company of his rollerboard product uh, full time. Um. What was the, and I don't know if you know this, and I'm sorry if you had to like go on a search because you're haunted by not knowing. What was the carrying capacity, like weight for like an overhead or, or any of that stuff at the time? I don't know. I don't know that they really still enforce that to this day. Really, it's about dimensions and how big it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think they assume you're not gonna be able to fit. 50 pounds into right. a 22 inch bag. Right. Yeah. Uh, so really, I think they try to uh, police it by uh, having regulations on the size as opposed to the weight. Because, like, but isn't weight a factor at all when loading a plane because there's a weight capacity? Yes. And, in fact, we have an episode, I don't mm-hmm. remember which one it is off the top of my head, where we talk about a crash that happened because the estimated weight tables they used for people and luggage was out of date and mm-hmm. people had gotten heavier and were carrying more luggage. Oh, no. So a plane uh, was unable to take off because it was overloaded I'm, without them knowing it. I'm assuming this is an American flight. Yes. <laughs> yeah. it, it was also a... It was like uh, up north in winter, so everyone had coats and coats, yeah. heavier, heavier stuff. Clothes. Yeah. And That's it was a full... Oh, I think they had more people on the plane than they... Yeah. It, there, there were a lot of contributing factors, but yes, weight is a concern. And most airlines have basically like spreadsheets or tables to figure out what an average person weighs, how much luggage they're bringing, how many bags they have on the plane Yeah, uh, to try to take all that into account. Wild. I, I, I am an active fitness enthusiast. I would not want to carry a 50-pound bag around. I'm no. surprised that that wasn't invented sooner. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's it really is surprising. Because it's not like people didn't have suitcases before planes. I think that maybe yeah. people were not, like travel wasn't as accessible because it was so expensive. So uh-huh. it wasn't something you did a lot. Just didn't so think maybe, about it. Yeah, people didn't have a lot of suitcases. So they had trunks that were put in carriages and stuff, right. but not really carried around. Yeah. Right. And, I can only just get rid of this carriage. Anyways. Um, security, we've already talked about this, was really lax at the airport. <laughs> and, uh, in airplane. Um, and everyone's going through. They're not checking boarding passes or anything. When Ted Stryker, the, like, the main character, shows up to the airport, he's driving a taxi. Uh, and I thought it was really weird. Because if you look at the side of the taxi, this is not aviation related. You can see how much um, the fare was. Hmm. And it was... 65 cents for the first sixth mile, then 10 cents every other sixth mile, which is a buck 15 for the first mile, then 60 cents every additional mile after that, which is 
unbelievably cheap. That's a hell of a deal. That's a great deal, uh, especially by now modern standards. Um, then, of course, someone gets in the taxi and he's like, I'll be right back. And he runs the meter anyway and then runs into the airport. Yeah. <laughs> and he just takes off fly, you know, on the plane. And they, if we erratically throughout the movie, they cut back to the guy waiting in the back of the taxi, just like <laughs> looking at his watch and like looking around for the... <laughs> How long would you wait before? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't wait. to would be like, what? No. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and uh, there's a scene where there's like a, a marshaler, an aircraft marshal, like a ground crew person waving in a yeah a plane with his uh flashlights uh-huh. um not using correct uh procedures to direct that plane at all mm. uh you know he kind of um is is moving both lights in one direction for the plane and someone asks him where's the cart and he uses both lights in the other direction and blaine's demonstrating the correct way to do it you put one hand in the direction you want them to go and then the other hand goes over your head waving back and forth to catch their attention yeah that makes mm. sense so it's like if you know, if you want them to turn right and they're facing you, you stick your left arm out and then with your right arm, you wave over your head to get the attention uh, or reverse for the other way. Right arm out, left arm waving for uh, the other turn. And a little bit of movie trivia or like movie connections, I guess. Uh, the main character, Ted Stryker, is, you know, running into the airport and you see him um, find his, uh, his girlfriend like, or wife, maybe girlfriend. They, they're they're, they're like ex-lovers yeah. or whatever. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, His love interest. Uh, and they have a conversation in the airport. And as he's running to, to try to find her, he runs past a mosaic tiled wall. Uh, and if you've ever seen the Quentin Tarantino film Jackie Brown, it's the same tiled wall from the credit sequence of Jackie Brown, where mm-hmm. Jackie Brown's it's going like through the airport. Long tracking shot. Right. Yeah, yeah. She's, she gets on like a people mover, like a moving sidewalk. And it's just like a long tracking shot with her being moved across the tile wall. Um, it's in the, uh, underground in terminal three of LAX before hmm. people movers. So the people mover didn't actually even exist in Jackie Brown either. They faked oh, it. Oh, interesting. Um, they, I believe it was a, like they, they put her on a dolly. I think Pam Greer sat down on a dolly mm-hmm. and then they, uh, just kind of moved it and made it seem like she was on a people mover, but it wasn't actually there. Cause I believe in Jackie Brown, they were supposed to film somewhere else. W- w- I, <laughs> I went down a rabbit hole with this and I think like that location <laughs> ended up not being available. So. Uh, they didn't have a people mover, so they had to like come up with a solution to film. They got LAX. Career. What was the alternative? Like <laughs> the moon? I mean, that's no. The- it was like another area of LAX. Oh, okay, uh, okay, okay. Uh, but then, like, there was a problem with dealing with the airport. Got it. Um, this specific plane in airplane. You're welcome to my hell. Uh, was a repainted TWA seven oh seven. Uh, it was delivered to TWA in 1966. Uh, it was eventually scrapped. It no longer flies. I don't think any airline flies a seven oh seven anymore. Uh, but it was a four-engine plane, uh, one of the earlier Boeing planes, very an early precursor, really ushered in the jet age. Did they uh, shoot on this airplane, and then the airplane actually went on to be continued to be used, or was this a retired plane at the time? They continued to be used. They just repainted it to say Trans American, mm-hmm. uh, which is the airline in the movie, which should have been Trans World Airways for TWA. Mm-hmm. I'm just surprised because like they're. They did a bunch of goofs and they're like spilling stuff. And did they, like, they actually pro- shoot? That was probably they, a set. A, I imagine I they built a set. Yeah. So you're talking about the exterior I'm talking shots. about the exterior, yeah. And Copy. again, you can see the serial number on the nose wheel uh, mm-hmm. on the doors for that. When, you know, Ted Stryker walks up to the counter in the, airpl- in the airport and asks, is Elaine Dickinson on this flight? And they look it up and they're like, yeah, she is. <laughs> can you imagine <laughs> asking, going up to that today and asking <laughs> if someone's on the flight and they tell you, yeah, they're here. That- uh, is wild. Though, I, I could see it happening back then. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Then he says he wants to buy a ticket for the plane, and they ask him, smoking or non-smoking? Again, <laughs> we just covered smoking in, yeah. a, in a plane. No, no more smoking on planes anymore. When uh, the, the pilots are preparing to taxi for the, to take off, there's a whole gag there, but um, they, they say, you know, flight 209 to ground control, ready to taxi. Uh, then ground control replies, 209, taxi to runway one to runway 19. So wrong. Uh, he would ask, you know, they would say they're ready to taxi. Ground would tell them specifically what taxiways to go on. They wouldn't just say taxi to runway 19. They'd say, mm. or they'd say runway 19. And then they would say taxi via Alpha, Golf, November, mm-hmm. ta- to runway 19. Especially at LAX, because it's so sprawling and big. Also, there's no runway 19 at LAX. <laughs> the runways are 0624 or 0725, right and left for both. And then they all have the whole Roger, Vector, What's our Victor? Clarence. What's our Vector, Victor? Yep. Uh, <laughs> this is stupid. 
And uh, you know, then then uh, they're still talking to on the radio. They say two oh nine, you're clear for takeoff. Departure frequency one two three point nine. Uh, LX departure frequency is actually one two four point three or one two five point two, not the correct frequency. And they would have been given the departure frequency when they were getting clearance earlier, not, not when they're clear for takeoff, yeah. ready to roll and mm. ready to go. Um, another bit of weird weirdness. Whenever they show the exterior of the plane flying, or you can kind of hear the background noise, it's always a propeller plane that you hear, even though this is a jet. Oh, the, oh the, yeah. The, uh, like a whining propeller. I wonder if that's sound. because that just was the sound you associated with it at the time. Like yeah, that was a more common airplane sound? By 1980, we're really in the... The jet age is firmly entrenched. Mm. Okay. Uh, Maybe. What I, from what I understand, the people who made the movie wanted to originally set the movie on a propeller plane, but the studio insisted they do it on a 707, so they just kept the propeller sound. Huh. Uh, that was actually a little tidbit to, to quickly deviate. Uh, this was all, it was like guys that basically took a script from a yeah. TV show, and then they rewrote, but they kept a lot of like the dialogue. So when you have these like really straight, serious performances, like it's it was an original script for something else that they bought a, the rights to. It was a movie. To. It was an actual movie. It was a movie they, called Zero Hour. Yeah. They took the script of the movie and then it. they were worried that it was so similar that they ended up getting the rights to the script. For how much? I don't know. I don't know. $2,500. Wow. Yeah. What a deal. From, from Warner Brothers, I believe. Yes, I was a Warner uh, film. Uh, yeah, so some of the like really ridiculous dialogue is straightly lifted from Zero Hour, yeah. which is another reason that they cast a lot of very serious actors to play these comedic roles, mm -hmm. like Peter Graves, um, Robert Stack, Leslie Nielsen. I think this was Leslie Nielsen's first comedic, comedic? role. Really? Yeah, uh, people thought of the, these actors as being like very straight, very serious actors, so that's why they hired them in here to kind of like create this juxtaposition because people were used to these being very... Serious. very serious dramatic actors and now they're here like giving this very straight That's... reads of this really comedic script and it almost like started a second career for Leslie Nielsen because yeah. he wanted well, to do yeah. the Naked Gun I, and, I feel like, like most people know him as a comedic actor. Yeah, his later that's work. all. That's Paul, really all I know him as. Drebin's, uh, what's the what's the TV show? Poli Police, Police Squad. Yeah, what's what, what year was Police Squad and all that? That's wild. Uh, because he's so good in this movie. Like, it, it, like the serious performances, and they're not like winking to camera and stuff like that. Like, everything's played so straight that that's why this movie that's works That's what so he's well. known for. Police Squad was 1982. Wow. So this really was predating all of Leslie Nielsen's comedic stuff. Mm hmm Incredible. Um, the overhead bins in the plane... Uh, this bothered me. The overhead bins in the plane don't have doors. It's just like an open shelf, and they put stuff up there. Oh. Is that inaccurate? I looked it up. It's actually accurate. Weird. That's the way they were in the 707 back then. Is there any netting or any straps? It didn't or? look like it. It was just like you put it up there. The, the interior of the plane was actually very authentic. So going back to what you were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. they may have filmed some of this, On if not all of it, in, in the actual plane because it looks very right. Like I had to look up pictures of what the 707 interiors look like for TWA, and it's very, very similar. Mm. I That's crazy that you just put it up there because it just seems like the Any stuff would be falling turbulence. all yeah. the time. Yeah. Well, there's no wheels, so <laughs> it's, a, it's a, lot more, a lot more stable. You know, they're, uh, they're approaching rough weather. Denver Air Traffic Control tells them to climb to 42,000 feet. They're flying from, the whole purpose of the movie is they're flying from LA to Chicago. Mm -hmm. So Denver tells them to try to climb over the, uh, the weather to 42,000 feet. Any long time black box down, a listener will know. When you're flying east, you fly at an odd thousand altitude. Oh. So they should have been flying at either 41 or 43,000. The service ceiling of a 707 is 42,000 feet. So 41,000 would have been appropriate, but that's still on the high end. They mm. probably would have been flying like 39,000, maybe mm. 37. These idiots. <laughs> <laughs> when the little boy Joey goes to uh, the, the cockpit, the pilot played by Peter Graves, uh, what's his name? Over? John Over? No, it would have been, no, it wasn't Roger. It was v Victor or Clarence. Clarence Over. Yeah, so, maybe. So. Over, over. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, he hands him a, like a toy model plane. So we have a present for you. You know, you're visiting our, uh, you know, for visiting the, the flight deck and it's a, it, the, the model plane he hands him is a 727. If you're, if you're curious, <laughs> I, I have to, I, anytime I see a plane on screen, I'm like, oh, I have to, what is that? Gus, they got there? I can sleep tonight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell the 727. It's got, it's a tri-jet. All three engines are at the tail. Interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You might also, you know, another tri-jet might've been like a, uh, DC-9 or an L-1011. Yeah. 
Interesting. Okay, so then what is that even? Is it one down one here? One in like kind of like the the vertical stabilizer at the base, and the two side by side, uh, kind of like an MD eighty. Okay. Okay. Um. So yeah. See, you joked. Now you know. Well, You'll yeah, because seven twenty seven all the time. I don't. I don't see many planes like that anymore. I feel no, like they're always yeah. on the wings. We also did uh, an episode where we talk about the rise and fall of trijets. Interesting. So going back to something we talked about earlier, when the autopilot named autopilot deploys, uh, he very accurately has three stripes as a first officer. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> job in final destination. Yeah, he's got three stripes on his shoulder and on his uh, uh, cuffs. The cuffs. Yeah. Yeah. Which, and if you haven't seen or don't remember, it's an inflatable man. Man. Pot. Yeah. yeah. They're like, <laughs> so it's like, a, yeah, a little blow up doll. Um, one interesting thing I thought is in the cockpit, they have like, uh, you know, all the instruments and everything. And there's like a clipboard in the back of the cockpit. There's an actual approach plate on that clipboard on the wall. Like, I don't know what airport is for. I can't see it's so small. But I was like, oh, like that's what an approach actually looks like somewhere. So I guess they must have found it and read it, put it up there for authenticity. Because the airplane, very authentic movie. When Ted Stryker first sits down, he kind of like try, in the cockpit to fly the plane. He kind of like goes over everything. And he's like checking. He's like, what's our airspeed? What's our altitude? You know, what's our engines? What's our mixture? You wouldn't check mixture in a plane like that. Mixture is normally used for like smaller, single smaller prop? planes. Yeah, a plane like that would handle it automatically. And the even, mix, ba even back then, yeah. You uh, well, I would assume so. I don't know, uh, just because it's a jet engine. Normally, on, on smaller planes or propeller planes, you manually adjust your mixture because as you go higher, there's less uh, less oxygen, so you need less fuel to compensate for that in the engine. That's way too many things to juggle at once. Yeah, so you kind of adjust your fuel flow to match the amount of oxygen. To Maybe keep a there's ratio. there's an argument to be made that he was going through that procedure because he wasn't he a fighter pilot right. in originally? the war. <laughs> the, the, the war, yeah, yeah. Also the the passengers were wearing in flight were wearing headphones to listen to in flight entertainment. Uh -huh. And these are old style headphones. I don't know if you guys have ever paid attention to them or seen them where they almost look like stethoscopes. Uh, you put them in your ears and like they kind of mm. kind of like have tubing that meet under your chin and then it goes down and you plug it into the armrest. Uh -huh. have, you ever, have you either you ever seen these? I've seen those types before, but I don't know. It's old. Uh, yeah. Wait, so when they first introduced uh, Leslie Nielsen's character, I thought was he actually wearing he a wearing, stethoscope? He did have a okay. stethoscope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but later in <laughs> what a stupid, oh my stupid God. bit. <laughs> But later in the movie, they do show passengers wearing these headphones that look like stethoscopes. So is that not wire transmitting to two speakers? Is it actually they're pumping audio through a tube? Or? They're pumping audio through a tube. The speaker is in the armrest. Wow. And you plug the tube into the oh. armrest right next to the speaker, oh. which picks up the sound and it travels through the tubes up to your that, ears. That's incredible. That's like some talk to my neighbor across the street like little kids, like cans talking yeah. into cans. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> that is crazy. Yeah, I, I, I only learned how these worked like a week or two ago. And yeah. then when I saw it in the movie, I was like, oh, I just read it. This is what I do in my spare time. I just read about these that a couple is, weeks ago. I can't, I, that is blowing my mind. It's, it's weird. If you look it up, it's bizarre. It's also weird that they could hear those. Right. Because how? like, I feel like on a plane, it's hard to hear normal headphones right. that actually are projecting sound. But also, like, wouldn't there be a lot of audio lead? Yeah. But I think or, they or, all... or just, like, the audio would spill out into the cabin. And you'd be able to hear so I, much. I think it was so loud you couldn't really hear sure. it. Sure. But wouldn't they, and wouldn't they back then have one thing that everyone watched? Right. So it, it would... Just play it on every speaker. Yeah, so it would be playing on all of them. So there wouldn't be, like, you know, a bunch of bleeding of different noises. Sure. It would just be the one. Yeah. Like a drive-in theater. Yeah. Only a couple things left here. Um, when they're coming in to land in Chicago, uh, you know, it's foggy and everything. And they're like, you can't land. Strikers like, Ted Strikers, no, I need to land. All these people need to go to the hospital. What's that? The big building with doctors inside. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, as they're about to land, he pushes forward on his control column to, to nose down to land at the last second. Uh -huh. That's a big no-no. You do not nose down. You crash the plane. <laughs> so do you, you lower... If you think about you, it, you, even you, as a passenger, you, you're never like pointed down at the ground when you're coming in to land. You're slightly reclined back. Yeah. Because the, the, you, you land with a nose up attitude and you pull power so the plane kind of sinks down and hits the ground. So and your gravity is landing the plane. Pretty much. You, you reduce your lift and kind of balance it 
like less lift with gravity, touch down with your main wheels, and then your nose wheel touches down last. Mm. Uh, that's why you'll like you when you're landing, you'll be you'll feel like you're slightly reclined, and then you'll come up to sit. Chur, chur. Yeah, yeah, because the back wheels always hit. Correct, first, or most they should. They should. If you yeah, if you land like striker, <laughs> you you risk like a breaking off your nose wheel or um, just it, like the nose it hitting the ground. ground right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, do not do that. And uh, last little last little tidbit I noticed. I was very happy about this too. Uh, you know, at the end when everyone's evacuating the plane, they show the tower and the exterior, and there's a light rotating on top of the tower. Mm. It's an alternating white and green light, which is actually the color of lights at a civilian airport if oh. if you're at the austin airport and you're over there uh at night uh or you know uh before the sun's up whenever there's not whenever there's less than vfr conditions is what they would say or nighttime you can see it if you go through security and you walk up to the windows directly in front of you and you look like towards the south you'll see that light rotating mm. white and green and that just indicates it's it's a civilian airport um, I'm assuming it's one white light on one side and one green light, and exactly. then it spins, but it gives the perception of flashing. Exactly. Okay. Uh, a water airport like we saw in Commando mm -hmm. uh, would have a rotating uh, white and yellow light. A uh, military airport would have two quick flashes of white uh, with green, and a heliport would have white, yellow, green uh, flashing. So just when you're flying, if you're looking for an airport and you see those flashes, you know, oh, there's an airport. That's a seaport or helicopter and you know more or less what you're looking at okay uh so just a little tidbit i think the tower they showed was way too small to be the, actually the o'hare tower it looked like a tiny mm -hmm. little aircraft control tower uh but it did have the correct kind of light on it uh the light at the austin airport's not on the tower it's further south mm -hmm. a little south of the south terminal you guys covered die hard 2 yeah, I did Die Hard too. okay yeah I, I bet that that one's like very flawed oh yeah <laughs> there was a lot going on there Anyway, that's it. That's my speed run of airplane. I, I took seven hours to watch that movie, so I could... <laughs> I don't know if that counts as a speed run. <laughs> I could uh, speed run it for you. It's uh, so good. Like, if you're going to watch any of these three movies, I think Airplane's got to be the one. Airplane's on HBO Max. That's how I watched it. I don't know how... What Commando's on Hulu, I think. Mm. Yeah, I think Final Destination. The bargain bin at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Airplane's just like, it's just like so many, it's high jokes per minute. It's just like one after another, after another, after another. I feel like it really was very influential and a lot of other things very referential of it uh, too, even to this day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it, like I said, it's a, uh, go if you're going to watch it, go into it knowing it's a movie of its time. It's, yeah, there's it's some, from 1980. Some there's that some age. stuff that would not that does not go over well today i was shocked watching i was like oh man how did i watch this when i was like eight yeah, yeah. it's weird too like going back to the the hari krishna thing i feel like that was a running gag it's like oh it's these these guys it, that are constantly it's, they were so prolific back then and I, then i guess obviously court but the filings made it so they couldn't but it was like the joke that like abuse of the hari krishnas was funny like i feel like airplane is one but i i think there's like it's another Leslie Nielsen movie. I think it might have been like Scary Movie or something where he like punches a Hare Krishna or something. But it's also an airplane. It's later when uh, Robert Stack's character shows up to the airport. He's like, he's trying to get through the, the terminal and he's like moving people out of the way. Yeah. And he punches the yeah. I feel like that happens a lot in movies. Yeah. They popularize that as like, oh. I think it was a, a common complaint amongst people. They, it, was, it was something they could sympathize with when they did travel. They, they knew that it was something they could expect. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Different well, times, man. Yep. Uh, well, we're going to be back with our normal episodes next week. Next week? Yep. And we also had a um, first class episode come out. Yes. So for those who support us uh, via Rooster Teeth First or just on, uh, you can do it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or go to blackboxdownpod.com and you can find out how to you know support the show directly for like $3. It's very helpful. Two ninety nine. Two ninety nine. First class? Yeah. That's who came up with that name. That's clever. This guy. That's great. <laughs> That's great. I uh, love that. But yeah, so thank you for every all, everyone who supports us on that. Um, and uh, and don't forget I, to check out Tales from the Stinky yes. Dragon. Yeah. yeah. If you're looking for something else to listen to right now, go look up Tales from Stinky Dragon. We it's should, great. We it's, should come up with another higher tier than a regular listener, like a like the stinkiest, the stinker. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll workshop it. it. Yeah. But yeah, highly recommend it. It's it's the Nat Twenties. Then yeah, there you go. Super fun for us to record and everyone. We really, yeah, want you to check it out because we love making it. It's the thing I work for, look forward to the most at work. And also we have these uh, incredible puppet videos that Chris and I both work on. Oh, actually, we have one that's 
actually plane focused. <gasps> that's right. That's oh yeah. That's coming out. So maybe maybe we'll uh we'll uh cross post it on Black Box Down Social. Yeah, because it's, it's 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 uh me and Gus uh in a oh all of us all of our characters in a, in a little uh, <laughs> fantasy airplane. Fantasy airplane. <laughs> That Chris and I worked on that making we the airplane together. He <laughs> yeah. had a Mach 1, and I, I came and fixed up a few things on it, but yeah. very fun. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. <laughs>